Okay. Well, hi, my name is Doug Uran I'm with MetroSite Group. I appreciate everyone packing the audience here on the last <laughs> session last day. Uh, I think Jeff is our jinx here. He told us in the New York IDC conference, I guess a couple months back, last session last day where the crowd was even thinner. Um, anyway, I just want to have a, a pretty informal discussion. We're, we're going to talk about a couple of emerging trends or uh, security things that we think are going to come to the forefront in the upcoming years and would encourage the audience to participate, you know, ask questions. Uh, we'll take a couple minutes here to introduce ourselves and then maybe a little background on each topic as we, as we discuss it. So uh, my personal background uh, is with a group called MetroSite Group where we are looking at emerging technologies in the security space, uh, helping them, helping figure out which ones are more interesting or less interesting to a, a large number of clients you know, in the Fortune 500 and the CISOs that we're helping to advise. So we're looking at the landscape, the threat landscape, and, and the new solutions or newer solutions coming to market. Jeff, you want to give a couple minute background on what you do? All right, I'm a guy that everybody's rushing not to see. <laughs> that, uh, I bring that cloud, that Charlie Brown cloud with me wherever I go. So uh, my background, I've, I've been uh, in the IT space for about 22 years and uh, also had security in, uh, uh, in the uh, Air Force, top secret clearances in that, those arenas. Most recently, I was at uh, EMC heading up Office of Risk Management. Obviously, I didn't manage it well enough because I'm not there anymore. Uh, XCISO uh, and uh, worked in financial services, insurance, and uh, actually started off in the mainframe environment as a computer operator, worked my way up through, wrote C code. So some of the problems you may exist, that exist today in code probably attributed back to me. And that's that cloud that I keep bringing with me. <laughs> so uh, in short, uh, wh what do you do when, when you're cut? You consult. So I've been down in DC doing a lot of consulting in that space and uh, fortunate enough to get uh, be part of this panel today to talk about some of the futures and the things we're seeing out there uh, in the security space. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Hambaker. I'm principal scientist with VeriSign. Uh, been in the web security space since uh, 1992, uh, back when we had 100 people using the web. <laughs> uh, so I'm probably the first web security consultant. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anybody else on the project who was. Uh, so it's all my fault, um, or actually, as I would prefer to say, it's the fault of uh, a certain chef in Geneva who uh, gave me food poisoning with a boulia base. And it was the two weeks that I was recovering from food poisoning in which they, I'm not kidding here, they stuck basic authentication into the web HTTP protocol, thus uh, setting the precedent for all the um, phishing attacks and they stuck CGI into the web server, thus inserting a scripting language into the heart of the web. And that's, that's how it all went wrong. It was that Boolean base. <laughs> all right. Rick? Uh, my name is Rick Howard. Uh, I spent the last 20 years managing big networks and securing big networks. I'm retired Army, and uh, my current job is I'm the Director of Intelligence for iDefense, and we do intelligence products for mostly financial uh, organizations and various three-letter agencies of different governments. I'm Anthony Arrett. I do security analytics for Trend Micro, and I came into the, the industry just this decade. Before that, I was in uh, telecom and dot-com and involuntarily left those industries in the 2001. <laughs> <laughs> so so one, of the, one of the trends that we all thought, and it's probably pretty obvious, and even sort of actually the presentation beforehand that Tony was speaking about was mobility. How are people accessing the network, the newer generations coming to the workforce? You know, what are the threats happening? And, and Rick, if you could just give a couple minute background, kind of talk about what it was and what it is today and, and All right. kind of set the stage. So first of all, I'd like to just say that, you know, guys like us uh, have been saying that mobile security or mobile platforms are going to be uh, hacked by the bad guys any second now for the last 10 years. So anything we can, any predictions we can make now, you have to take a little grain of salt. Um, but I, there's a couple of things just been changing here in 2008 and 2009 that makes this kind of 
flow to the front of the uh, threat queue. Uh, mostly is the smartphone and the ability to do uh, financial transactions on these devices. I was listening to a podcast with, um, uh, by Walt Mosberg. He's the tech editor of the Wall Street Journal. And he said, here's the difference between the BlackBerry and the iPhone. All right, the BlackBerry is a mobile phone that through some trickery with SMS allows people to view web pages in a vulgar and ugly way. An iPhone is a mobile, wireless, handheld Unix box that just happens to do phone calls. All right, so, and what's happening, what we've seen in the last couple of years, uh, is that more and more ways that we can use this device to do financial transactions. And if that's where the money is, that's where the bad guys are gonna go. So just a couple of data points. I was in South America last year and I was talking to a startup company. Uh, they've got a 60 person uh, pilot going on uh, in a small city that allows them to do grocery shopping with their mobile phones. So you basically go to the uh, grocery store, you get your groceries, bring it up to the cashier, cashier rings it up, he sends you your bill via SMS, you put your pen in, return it, and your bill shows up on your phone bill and not your credit card. So, and that's sort of where it's going, and this kind of thing's been going on in the East for many years, and the West is just starting to catch up with that. Uh, and that's just one data point we need to worry about. So what I'm worried about is all the new applications that are going to come on that it's going to be easy to hack, and that's sort of the situation we are in now. Uh, at iDefense, we've been saying that mobile phone uh, threats are like five, ten years down the road, but I'm thinking we're changing our mind that it's probably here now. And if you listen to what Tony said uh, in the previous uh, presentation, uh, we have just begun to think about uh, securing these devices. I was at the DOD Cybercrime Conference uh, a couple weeks ago and watched the Fed forensics guy take everything off an iPhone, that is address book, all the emails, all the voicemail, all the, uh, uh, anything that was any importance, using nothing but a cradle and iTunes. Okay, he didn't hack it, he didn't crack it, he didn't do anything. He just basically plugged it in and took everything off the uh, phone. Uh, so that's kind of the state of the art where we are. Hmm. So Anthony, are, are you seeing these kinds of things happening in, in your world of the, you know, malware and other types of communications that are compromising phones or at least a demand in the marketplace for that? Yeah, I think without taking anything, with completely agreeing with everything that you're saying, you know, in terms of, of what, of the huge task we have in terms of, of the potential mobile threats, there is a different problem, which is we constantly are predicting, or you see all these predictions of these coming mobile threats, and one of the problems is, is that I think we're under the, this illusion that they're going to look like the threats we're used to. And the threats we're used to really has more to do with the evolution of Windows than it does with the inherent threats themselves. And so there's this, this you know, we, we make the mistake, it's like fighting the previous war type of thing. I mean, a lot of, a lot of what we deal with today in, in, in what we think of as malware threats and the kinds of threats. So we imagine all these Windows types threats showing up in, in the mobile space and they're not going to look like that. I mean, if for no other reason than we learned something in the process of 25 years of evolution of Windows. Well, it's funny what we're seeing as attack as the way that bad guys are leveraging the mobile phone. They're using really simple attacks, uh, basically spamming customers with email or SMS messages and trying to convince them to click on the link that's a chargeable link. You know, so that's just that's just old uh, uh, old modem attacks that we used to do in the old days. So, and that's what is most profitable that we're seeing in, in the East right now. Well, I believe that uh, every technology goes through three phases. Phase one is concern, and that's where it's just starting up. And in the first stage of the web, we had lots of concern about security. Everybody wanted to talk to, talk to me. Everybody wanted to uh, hear about the problems that might be coming up. The second phase is complacency. Once folks start to get familiar with the technology, they start to, um, you know, they learn to live with it, they're uh, less worried. And the third stage, as we know, is negligence. And at the moment, we're in the concern stage. So every one of these phones has some mechanism to kill rogue applications that might get onto the phone and start using that payment mechanism to go and make premium rate calls to uh, some corrupt telephone company in Moldova, little then share some of the cash back with the hackers. And you know, these are real attacks. 
And it's quite interesting, the politics there, in that international telephone settlements are set by treaty. So the phone company says, we've got to pay the money. It's not our choice. We've got to pay the money. And uh, I say to that, well, I've got a phone here. And I don't need to be able to call Moldova. So why have you given me that capability when I've not asked for it and it's a corrupt telco there? And moreover, why are you turning my telephone bill into your payment mechanism? I never asked for it. And most of the people who've been getting these telephone bills for a thousand, two thousand bucks, they never asked for their telephone bill to be turned into a global payment system. So if we're going to get a hold on the mobile payments, we can try and use the kill switches, which will last maybe another year, two years at most, at which point the pressure to turn them off will just get too big. Because at the moment, you've got an, a competition issue. You know, there's a no monopoly thing. Once Google, Google Android starts up, the pressure will be on Apple to open up the iPhone. You will see the iPhone unlocked. You will see everything unbundled at which point it be open field day. Well, that's a good point. I, um, part of the stuff that iDefense does is that we're bug hunters. Uh, and most of the mobile platform uh, vendors provide the software development kit for anybody that wants it. That, for all, most of you guys out here, you already know, that's like giving them the keys to the city. It shows how all the APIs work, how the software works underneath the table. So it's not going to be too hard to figure out how to break these phones once they start doing it in mass. And actually getting back to an earlier point that you're mentioning, what's the difference between mobile payments that you're seeing domestically versus international? I mean, give us a little bit of that uh, perspective that I think we can be insular here just being U.S. citizens and potentially not traveling overseas as much. Well, if the application's coming in from, a, or, the bad guys can be anywhere in the world, including the states. All they need to do is to have a, an accomplice in another country. And then the international telephone system settlements require payments to be made. And at the moment, you do not have the government standing up and saying, hell no. If our consumers are being defrauded, the money must not get out to the bad guys. International treaties or known international treaties, go and fix it. A very easy way to, instead of kill switches, just put a cap on every phone bill. If I could say, under no circumstances will my phone bill for my mobile go above $100. And then if I'm using the phone, if it's stolen, whatever, it's used up that month. And if uh, AT&T want any more than $100, tough. And that's a regulation mechanism that would kill that particular fraud channel dead. Hmm. Much more effectively than the kill switch. So, Jeff, you've, you've run security at a number of organizations. How long is it, have, has the adoption of these kinds of countermeasures, maybe not to the extreme effect Bill was talking about, but within more controllable environments? Yeah, to me, everything's got an economic base. And we come out with, with uh, devices like this. The first thing is I want to make sure we can sell it, right? It's all about it getting these things out there and selling them first, getting people attracted to buy it. Down the road, then you start looking at, oh, heck, I got to get some controls around this, and I got to start uh, seeing if I can fix it. And these now we've got, uh, you know, you'll get folks like Trend or McAfee, others, I got to throw some AV on that. They throw it on there, and it just about kills the performance. The battery dies quick because it's just not built for that. It wasn't architected that way. So when I see that these controls will come afterwards until there's value, we're, we're all about making money in this country and there's nothing wrong with that. But what we forget is we don't start with any security up front because it's too costly to build it in. We don't know if it's gonna work first. So it's an after fact type of thought that we, that we, we look at it uh, in fixing these things. And therefore, we're always scrambling to, to, to uh, make sure that we're not at risk. And this kind of goes to cloud computing. We'll talk about that as well. But, when I look at this stuff, I see until, and Rick, back to your point about, you know, we've been talking about this for 10 years. There isn't a whole lot of value, uh, uh, information of value on these devices yet because we're not using them like they are in Japan and other places. I think the criminals go where there's information that they can get. And I'm not going to, these guys are, are real smart. 
I'm not going to waste my time trying to penetrate a phone if there's nothing on it. I'm going to wait until there's something of value and know that the American way is they're going to try and catch up later. In the meantime, I will be fil filtering that data into my box, and I'm not going to let them know. I'm going to keep my transactions quiet, and I'm going to steal that data. So when it comes to the controls, I think it's always a reactionary perspective on this. And I think it will happen, like you said, but once things of value start to go there, uh, I think then we're, start, we're going to see significant amounts of uh, uh, malicious activity in that space. I mean, so. I think it's going that way. I mean, Citibank is rolling out a uh, chip now for their mobile users that allows them to do mobile banking. Uh, I think I, I read this this morning that the, the uh, prediction is 115 million mobile, apple, uh, mobile phone users using their mobile phones to do banking operations by 2011. All right, so, I mean, the, uh, the tidal wave is coming. And I just think it's a matter of time as technologists in the security and against the security measures are getting more comfortable, you know, understanding Android, understanding the OS is how they're working, and sort of attacking that new medium, that new platform, as applications are being brought to market in that sense. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, Vicky, I had an interesting point about setting a limit on uh, the uh, amount of Before either of my kids get a cell phone, <laughs> the telephone companies will have to have provided me with an assurance that I can control their billing. And until that happens, the kids don't get the phone uh, until they're 18 and can pay for them themselves. And you know, it's not just, a qu and if you talk to a lot of parents, you'll get exactly that same response in the, the number of parents that I've talked to who have taken the kids' f cell phones away after an SMS messaging meltdown is quite large. So, you know, it's not just that uh, this is a matter of security, there's also a business opportunity here. Sure, AT&T and Verizon and so on can make a few bucks out of creaming a small number of customers, but they only get to cream each customer once. And when they lose that customer, they lose them for a long time. I'll just to add to that. I have a 13 and 14 year old. I gave him cell phones and uh, I can limit the number of text messages to 50 a month. I can shut down no, no data flows across it. And I can limit who, what calls come in by number and which ones go out. So they don't like me very much, but they do have <laughs> cell phones. So I, Kind of gone so down that like route. So yeah. <laughs> like these kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This may sound a little facetious, but how old are your kids? Three and seven. I would predict you lose that battle. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check with you I in got, a few years. I Most fathers out here uh, probably would vote with me. It, it's a huge problem. I mean, I, I had five, and I got a three hundred dollar bill from a, a call to an adult service one time that one of my boys made. So I agree it's an opportunity. I, who's your carrier that lets you restrict that? Hey. Yeah. AT&T. Yeah, AT&T really? doesn't. Yeah. AT&T's got it. Okay, so maybe they're listening. They, they never listen to me, so, <laughs> okay. Any, any other questions from the audience as we, before we move topics? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, it seems like there's more valuable data available and moving more quickly into cloud computing than mobile devices. And I wonder if the panelists could, could address that. Well, um, actually, that's not the next, but that's the third topic we're going to talk about. I mean, cloud computing is a huge, uh, <laughs> is a huge storm coming. Okay, I'll wait. So that's certainly coming on the, on the horizon. Any other on mobility? On once, twice. Um, so another topic that we we were all talking about when we were putting the panel together, uh, an interesting one is sort of cyber warfare. 
and now that's evolved from a you know state sponsored you know country to country or at least you know in in years past or thought of in that sense to a more state sponsored uh corporate espionage and going after actual commercial interests and uh, there's been a lot of sort of back and forth on how that's happened so you know, Phil I thought you could tell the audience sort of a little bit about the evolution of how that's moved you know over time <clears throat> threats well when we started off with the web everybody's saying oh Security, it's going to be something big. Yeah, we've got to be serious and so on. And I'm saying, well, yeah, we've got to take this thing seriously because someday we're going to be doing banking online. And then a little while later, folk are kind of like um, ratcheting up the dire predictions. And, you know, the, the predictions about cybercrime start to be, well, they're going to be stealing billions of dollars from world banks, etc., etc. And you know how the set, you, you've been listening, you probably heard the statement from the FBI that uh, cybercrime is going to cost uh, a trillion dollars and uh, is the third biggest threat to the country. Uh, sorry, cyber terror. And, you know, there's kind of like this race going on to make the most dire statement possible. So, since we're on the record here, I'll just say that cyber terror and cyber warfare is going to end, lead to the extinction of all life on the planet <laughs> and bring about the destruction of the universe. <laughs> so now that the FUD battle is over, and as Colbert says, I've won, <laughs> let's get real. Now, what happened with all those dire predictions was that after a while, everybody switched off. And people like me and people who were trying to say, there's a problem here that you've got to be rational about, nobody was listening to us because they all had heard too much hype. And that's the real danger of this hype talk, is that one that we turn off when we don't take the, a real threat seriously, and the second is that we address the wrong threat. Now, cyber warfare is real, but nobody's gonna fight a war from a computer alone they're going to use the computer and the network to enhance their existing capabilities. And we see terrorists using the net for communications, for propaganda. Website defacements are a big part of the uh, terrorists' arsenal. Because you can, you know, if you've got people going to the biggest consumer websites in uh, Israel and they're seeing Hamas propaganda on the front page, that's a propaganda coup. If you're looking at defending against them, though, you're more interested in how much money can they get for bombs and bullets and so on. And one, my concern has been, how do we deny the money to the terrorists? And we've got uh, senior terrorists who are saying, go work out how to do this cybercrime thing, because you can make more money from fishing in a month than a Pakistani policeman will earn in his lifetime. And cutting off the flow of cash is key. In that if you look at uh, what happened after 9-11, the IRA gave up. And they gave up for one reason. The money was no longer coming in from the states. NORAID was no longer holding fundraisers. So I'd, I'd like to draw a distinction between cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, and cyber espionage. Um, because they're all three different things. Cyber warfare has kind of morphed uh, in the last couple of years, uh, meaning that we've all expected various governments to be able to conduct some sort of cyber warfare as a force multiplier for some combat operations on the ground. Okay, well, most governments worth their salt can do that. What we've seen in the last couple of years, though, is that the Russians have mobilized their amateur hacker force to be a force multiplier with, without getting any responsibility for it. We've seen three cases of it. We've seen Estonia. We've seen Georgia, and we've seen Kyrgyzstan, even though Kyrgyzstan was sort of a reverse uh, effort. Uh, the reason it's reverse is the Kyrgyzstan officials are pro-Russian, and they called the denial of service in on themselves because they were trying to stop their um, enemies from talking bad things about them. 
but still all done through amateur pro-Russian hacker groups from various parts of the world being able to manipulate the country uh, to cause uh, some sort of battlefield effects. All right, so that is really uh, happening right now, and we expect to see that going forward. The Russian government views their amateur hacker group as state assets. They don't really control them very well. They just kind of spin them up and get out of the way because they're not sure what the hell they're going to do, but uh, they still view them as assets. Uh, and, so and that is not the same thing as what cyber terrorism is, okay? And the, the cyber terrorism folks, uh, we haven't really seen that in the world today. Cyber terrorism, by definition, needs to cause terror, needs to cause us to be afraid, and we really haven't seen that yet. What we've seen is hacker groups in the Middle Eastern part of the world using cyber fraud techniques to fund their terrorist agenda, okay, but not really any cyber terrorism on the net. Yeah, but I mean, I, I agree that a cyber terror attack is a ludicrous proposition. Right. I mean, like, if you look at uh, one of the effects of 9 11, the stock exchange was shut down for what was it, four days? Mm. Who cared? Yeah, nobody cared. The, and London, the London Exchange went down last year for a whole day and nobody cared. Yeah, so I mean, like, the doom and gloom propositions of you shut down the bourse and capitalism falls, you know, that's just clearly nonsense. Right. Um, there are some terror attacks that could be extremely painful, but I don't think that it's very likely that you see the end of society. But what you can see is using the net and cyber operations as part of a... Uh, what, the military use this awful term, kinetic attack, mm -hmm. when they really mean bombs. <laughs> yeah, that's what we mean. Yeah. And, you know, don't underestimate the, uh, the multiplier effect. Well, that's what I'm saying. In the Georgia attacks last summer, okay, before the tanks rolled, okay, there was the cyber denial of service attacks going into that country. Uh, so it acted as a force multiplier, causing uh, confusion to the leadership of that country. And, uh, and giving them a hesitation about what they should do. So that's kind of a... Uh, yeah. I, mean, I, I hate the classifications because you know, it's the idea that when we're trying to, we're trying to impose pre-existing categories onto the badness coming out of the internet, are you going to get it wrong because you're fighting the last war? I mean, like what you're just describing uh, with the uh, Russian Business Network and Co., very much the same as what some governments have been doing for years with deniable, op deniable operations. Uh, the rise of terrorism in West Germany, the Bader Meinhof gang and so on, was linked to East Germany and the Soviets looking for some way to do deniable, low intensity warfare. Mm -hmm. And you look at what uh, these hit operations against their competition looks somewhat uh, reminiscent in objective to some of the death squad uh, operations that some of the rogue uh, dictatorships in Latin America have been up to. Well, I like what you said about the low-levelness of it, okay, because that's kind of what it is. Yeah, go ahead. One possible legitimate effect of your read about uh, the vulnerability of control systems for uh, electrical generation plants, nuclear power plants, that sort of stuff. Do you guys have any light to shed on what those, fo well, number one, how feasible something like that might be to gain control of a nuclear power plant and threaten to cause a meltdown? I have no idea how those things are really constructed. Are, are those folks taking these possibilities seriously, or is that doom and gloom kind of stuff. Well, I think, I mean, I think it was proved that, you know, that is a possibility, right? I mean, with the DHS and uh, the shaking, that video that came out, and was it earlier last year? <laughs> so there's at least access in terms of how people are reacting to it, Anthony, you well, have perspective? I mean, I, I come from a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing a very commercial bias to it because of trend, the, the, the business we're in. But the thing with all of these things to, the, 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 and these conceptual classifications and, and these scenarios are, the bad guys are not, we, by whatever uh, area they're going to apply their stuff, wherever, they don't work from conceptual possibility. You know, they don't work from conceptual designs. They work primarily from repurposing successful implementations. So if you're looking for where the, the real threats are, the real present imminent threats, 
are from what, you, what bad guys can do repurposing what's successful that's out there. And that's why I think denial of service is something, they didn't develop that out of some conceptual design. That's something that was, that's highly developed, highly successful, a denial of service attack, and they just repurposed it for, you know, national military purposes, basically. Well, I, I think, though, for that, that community of security folks, the, the SCADA folks, uh, they've been, for the last 10 years, you guys tell me if I'm wrong about this, but they've been sort of living in a security through obscurity model. Um, they, didn't, they didn't want to talk to anybody else in the security community because their stuff is too important. Uh, they will take care of it themselves. Uh, they almost excommunicate yeah. themselves. Exactly. The well, yeah. I was an apprentice uh, in the control engineering group at uh, ICI before I went to university. So it's your fault for that, too? Uh, well, <laughs> at that time, control systems were controlled by a protocol called Modbus running over RS-485. Uh, yeah. And today, it's running Modbus. And, you know, the thing about Modbus is it, there are no acknowledgments of any command that you send. So you say to that valve, move. The valve never says that it received the command. And it certainly never sends back a note to say that it moved. So, I mean, like, forget about authenticating that uh, command or anything like that. Now, at that time, we had computer networks. We were running DetNet Phase 4. Um, we had networks, but we always had an air gap model. Today, there's uh, no air gap model. In fact, there's barely a firewall model. And you know, I talk to uh, folk in the industry and they say, oh, we've got a group that's looking into it. And there are 200 people in the group designing the next generation of security. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, yeah, that's going to help. Um, now, on the nuclear physics stuff, on nuclear power station stuff, yeah, I do have a degree in nuclear physics. Um, I don't think it's very likely that you're going to see somebody get a plant to blow up, but there are plenty of ways that you can permanently disable a power plant by using the safety systems against it. I'll, I'll give you one ex example, uh, which I don't think would work on, I don't think is current. Um, most of your light water reactors have you, know, you have your graphite moderator, you have your boron control rods. Most of those have a mechanism to blow boron dust into the core of the reactor as kind of like the last thing that you do if it's going to go into meltdown. Um, when I was on a um, tourist trip around Trasvinath uh, nuclear power plant, I was standing 20 inches away from the boron control feeds. If I'd have flipped up two uh, covers, pressed the buttons, and they hadn't managed to drag me off within 20 seconds, the boron, control, the boron dust feed would have started. And once it started, it is impossible to get the boron out of the reactor. One dead nuclear power station. There are, now if you look at uh, how close to the burn some parts of this country is in its generation capacity, and then you consider that nuclear is used for the base load. Sure, I could deny you uh, some power. So isn't that gloom? I mean, as systems are getting connected, as people are coming online and waking up in all parts of the world, you know, there's just more access to these systems. Oh, oh. no, no, I've not started on the gloom and doom. Uh, the, the gloom and doom is what's happening with active intelligent uh, power. Because at the moment, all the asset is at the power station. Uh, what they're doing at the moment is that they're wiring up all these uh, air conditioning systems so that they're intelligent and the power station company can turn them on or off or up or down or whatever. So how about this for a scenario? I get control of that control loop and I turn on all the air conditioners in uh, California or in Southern California on a nice hot day. I think I could probably blow a few power stations up. I think that all of us here could come up with our scary scenario about how some bad guy could cause terror or something on the inter on the net. I was just reading a, something in the news this morning about how some hospital in the U.S. is currently fighting uh, a worm through their network and they're, it's, um, 
it's blocking surgery scheduling because they can't get it off the net. All right, so I'm sure we can figure out a way to give the wrong medicine to the wrong person to cause that person to die. And I think you can all come up with your own personal scary story of how we might be able to inflict it. I think what we all have to do in this room, though, is drag the SCADA people back into the light with the rest of us, right? They, just this last year, there were actually 15 exploits written for SCADA control systems. That's the first time that's ever happened. They've always been kind of in the dark. We just need to kind of drag them into the light and keep them into the conversation so that uh, they modernize their stuff. Um, that's about well, that's is, isn't part of their protection that they are so disconnected? Well, that's what they say, but it's, I think what you were saying is not true. Okay, they say they are, but they're connected no. all over the place. Right? No, I, and going back to your point about uh, the, um, the path towards the attack, in that at the moment, SCADA is mostly limited to process control. However, one of the fun trends that's going on is home automation. And if you look at what the, the home automation systems that act, you know, there's two sorts. There's the sort that are more likely to burn down your house than actually automate it because, you know, they're made out of out-of-spec electronic components. The capacitors will, you know, I've taken a look at some of that stuff and you don't want it. And then there's the stuff that's basically repurposed industrial process control designs. And you'll find that they've got their uh, Modbus uh, control ports on, on them, et cetera. And so basically, think of it as training wheels for hackers. So they'll get in, they will download the same control systems for Modbus. They will get themselves into this whole uh, world. And then they'll uh, start looking for something more interesting to do than opening garage doors when dogs are barking. So can we, uh, we talked about cyber warfare, we talked about cyber uh, terrorism. I want to bring us back around to cyber espionage. And if you're doing business in China, which a lot of uh, enterprises are doing these days. You need to understand the culture there. It is perfectly acceptable in that part of the world to conduct cyber attacks, cyber raids on your competitors. Okay, it's legal, or well, maybe it's not legal, but it's not, nothing's done about it. And you gain face if you're successfully uh, shaming the other competitor. And for large enterprises, big companies there, it's acceptable for divisions within the enterprise to shame other divisions in the same outfit. Okay, so if you're doing business there, okay, you need to understand that because you're going to be getting hit by those kinds of attacks uh, in that country. So that's kind of like what Adam was saying was going on with Microsoft, where yeah. they, you know, if you don't lock down your terminal when you move away from the, you know, you leave it unattended, anybody can go and play silly games on it. It's not a culture there. Okay. Any, yeah. any other thoughts on cyber, you know, cyber warfare, cyber well, security before we I move just, on to the yeah. cloud? Uh, just one quick comment on it. I have an advocation where I have personas in different uh, jihadi social networks as, as a sideline on the side. So I'm into these sites and having conversations with these folks out there and, uh, and you know, not as me, but as someone else. I put on my bat cape at night and I go in and and uh, keystroke into these sites. But uh, what these guys are looking at this really, as you mentioned, is propaganda. But it's recruitment networks. And it's, uh, we talk about the cyber terrorism. And we look at asymmetrical warfare and what they've done with airplanes, with different uh, infrastructures that we own as they use our infrastructure against us. They're going to use the internet for, for data gathering. They don't want it to go down. They don't want to attack it to drop it. They want it for recruiting. They want it for sending information back and forth. They want it for education and training so they can go out and perform physical attacks. They do want the, uh, uh, they do use it for collecting and stealing credit card information and making money. But uh, what comes out of it is at this point, I don't think, uh, at least these guys are not sophisticated enough to execute any cyber type of attack that of any significance. They tried to raise an e-jihad back in November of, what was it, 07, that died on the vine. So what you see them doing is really using it for different purposes so they can execute an attack against that nuclear power plant with some other infrastructure. And they don't have to get inside it. They'll just use some physical action is what I'm seeing there. Well, I agree with that. In fact, there's been multiple fatwas released in the Middle East that sort of authorizes cyber fraud as a way to legitimately raise money for their own agendas. Uh, there was one by, I can't think of the guy's name now, but he was out of Cairo. And he's kind of a big sheik. Kind of, I mean, the little guys say it all the time. There's de raging debate in the forums whether or not it's legal to do that. But when he comes out with it, it's sort of given a blanket uh, carte blanche for those guys to do those operations. And 
tell you one thing that's even scarier than that. The Middle East hackers know they're not as good as some of the other parts of the world, so they contract that stuff out to people who are better, right. namely the Russians. Yes, cyber okay. mercenary. Cyber mercenary. All right. Okay, well, so. this is actually a, an element of the whole ecology that's got to be thought through in that all that infrastructure that's being built up for cybercrime can be repurposed. So those mulling networks that are used to launder cash for that's been stolen out of bank <coughs> network can be used to launder drug to cash. Absolutely. And you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to do cyber warfare and you wanted to, you know, it wouldn't work because you know you develop an attack, you've got your zero day attack and you want to set it off and oh dear, it's been patched. These days, you can't rely on any particular attack working but you know that on any given day, you will be able to buy one that'll be good for the next 24, 48 hours. And so 10 years ago, you know, the British, Americans, French, Israelis, maybe the Russians at that point would have had that capability and would have had the uh, resources to do that credibly. Today, much wider range of actors. Anybody who's prepared to pay, you know, you just need to keep it in with the right circles. Yeah, I, I think that comes back to your complacency and negligence phases that we view the, uh, think that this, this repurposing between cyber crime and all of your category, all of your uh, cyber warfare categories is that the kind of complacency we're in, we have a history of, uh, you know, our, our sort of, I don't know if it's Cold War history or whatever, but our organized crime as sophisticated as it is, has always been basically patriotic, you know. That's true. And the kind of cyber crime, the kind of organized crime that is developing around the around the net and around cloud computing, around things today, there's nothing that doesn't have that patriotic element to it. It doesn't see that it is a, you know, living off the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, it, it, it has no interest in protecting the commons the way well. that. Well, organized crime in the past has had more of that. There is an element of that where, you know, Russian, Russian hacker groups, you know, in the Estonia case or Chinese hackers and infiltrating U.S. government areas where they're acting on behalf of national interests, even though they're disassociated formally. So there, there's still that element that's yeah. theme, the but, common theme from the past. But I'm thinking more in terms of, of, of the example that you just gave, where the Middle East, you know, you have some jihadist type of thing hiring the Russians to, you know, if, if, if they were going to hire them to bring down the internet, mm -hmm. they, would, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be very successful right. in getting them to hire to bring down the internet because the internet is what keeps these guys in business. Yeah, but, but there are elements that you do have to be careful. What, there is a lot of stuff that's for hire, and these guys are perfectly willing to do it. Yeah, but I mean, you say, you know, everybody depends upon the internet, but heck. You look at the number of uh, attacks against the uh, root DNS, right, it's enormous. I mean, like, there are plenty of people whose egos are big enough that they uh, would like to bring down the internet just for the heck of it. And there's plenty of money that could be made by taking high profile parts of the internet down for short periods of time. Right? The DDoS uh, extortion frauds. But are much more credible. If you can take out Amazon for a week or an hour and it gets onto the New York Times. But, but so realistically, I mean, realistically, how much money are you talking about there compared to having networks of zombies that generate spam? I mean, that's producing the 90, 95, 98% of the income of, of cybercrime is coming from, from, from uh, you know, running spam out of, uh, out of distributed IPs. You know, it's, it's, that's where the money is. And so, th th I mean, there's no money. I mean, the money you can make bringing down some central infrastructure from them, so it's of less interest. I'm not saying they're not there, right. but that's not where the motivation it's is. It's not mechanized. It's that's not, not the, mechanized. That, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's no different than which, which the, the, the bank robber says he robs banks because that's where the money is. That, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, they're going to go where the money is. That Willie means, Sutton. So, hmm? Willie Sutton. Oh, yeah. Willie Sutton. Yeah. So, so the third thing that we thought was compelling and overwhelming and is now on a obviously increased trend is cloud computing, outsourcing, you know, the efficiencies that are inherent. Jeff, do you want to give a little bit of a well, overview on, on sure. to set the stage for this topic? The first thing to know is that cloud computing is, is not new. 
So it's really whatever is old is new again. Cloud computing or the utility aspects of it and the virtualization really started in the mainframe environment where you could partition. And back working with the GE days, we used to sell computing space and time on the machines and based on the day, time of day, you would have a higher price. Wherever you want to prioritize to get your job run, you'd have a higher price for that. So utility computing came in those days. And then they started putting, you know, you started getting RACF and Top Secret and ACF2 uh, involved in, in, uh, from a security an angle. So over the years, you've, uh, you've had folks like Bill Joy and, and folks at Sun talk about uh, the computer, the network is a computer. As they move towards that, we're getting closer to that. And then you had IBM in 2001 come out with uh, their, their autonomic computing uh, manifesto, uh, per se, about multi-tenancy and shared resources out there and the auto provisioning. And we're starting to see that, where you can go out today and I say, you know, I, I want to, uh, I can go online and create an account, pay you some money, and I'm going to provision this amount of CPU, that much RAM, the storage over here. And you don't really know where it is, but I'm provisioning something out there that's going to create a space and I'm going to go and use that, and I'm going to start uploading it, putting paper, uh, uh, data out there, and I'm going to start making money. I can do it very quickly, and it's a shared resource there. Now, it, you're seeing more and more of that, and, and prior to that, you had folks like uh, the managed service spaces back in uh, 98 through 2001, 2002, where they started building these huge infrastructures out, the managed service data centers. I was a director of engineering at Navisite. We built these four and five nines, high availability architecture stacks that they survived it. All the engineers got cut, uh, but they're out there, and now they're calling it's not managed hosting anymore, it's cloud computing. So it's not old, it's just repurposing and renaming it and making it easier to get to and easier to provision. Now we're in an economic downturn where no one wants to spend capital. So it's not CapEx anymore, it's OpEx, it's operational expense. And they can do it very quickly. And my fear is, I throw this that because of this speed they can go out and provision it, because the, the money is tight, we're going to go and do this, we're not going to worry too much about it, the business is going to drive it. And we're going to go out there because IT is too slow anyway. So we're going to provision these services and we're going to start doing business on the web very quickly. We can turn it on, we can shut it off whenever we want. And uh, the contracts are kind of weak. We don't know what we've got. So when I look at this, it's, it's really, there's a lot of fear to be had. And I don't want to get in the FUD space, but in this climate, you're going to see people rush to the cloud and rush blindly. And again, that economic base, we'll figure out the security after the fact. And as the value goes there, the attacks will go there. So it's interesting how the fear as an enterprise is uh, moving their data, moving their information out into the cloud. What's, you know, Anthony, some of the things that we were talking about earlier, what's, what are some of the benefits from a security perspective that this cloud computing module or state of mind kind of provides us now? I, I think you're absolutely right about what hasn't, what hasn't changed. But, but I think what the, the key issue is what has changed. And if you look 20 years ago, the average knowledge worker went to work and 80% of the information they needed to do their job was derived from inside the enterprise network. And today, 80% is outside, is coming from outside. It's just the, the, the fact is the infor, just the daily information transactions of every of, of almost all knowledge workers today is, is already in the cloud. All the information transactions are taking place in the cloud. So this is a, in, in many ways, this is just a natural evolution. And it's overcoming the illusion that you can live behind this moat of the enterprise network. And, and so many of these things are natural ways. And in some ways, this is like the, uh, the um, you know, it's like the, the Cold War peace dividend. I mean, the, 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 gains that, the gains that we're getting from, quote, cloud computing really represent that once, once we give up this moat mentality that we can defend, that we actually can defend a, an enterprise network by cordoning it off from the rest of the world, is you realize that there's a lot of cost savings now. And I think a lot, that's what we're seeing. But it does raise a whole bunch of issues about how do you, you know, what, what, what are the implications for security? And well, I agree with both of you. How many out there run big IT networks right now? Anybody run an exchange server farm? Okay. For me, I used to run a big exchange server farm, and the idea of being able to outsource that to somebody else, let them manage that whole thing, that's a huge draw for an IT guy. I would do that in a heartbeat, not even thinking about security, okay, because it's so much of a pain in the rear end to manage those things. So that is the big trade for the IT guy. I think you can do this smartly. Okay, you don't have to put the, the, uh, the jewels of the kingdom in the cloud. You can kind of keep protect that yourselves if you want to do that. 
but you can take all that extraneous stuff and get all that stuff off your back. So I think that is one of the benefits you're going to see, and it's coming. No one's going to shut it off. It's a big dream coming right now. Some of the other pieces here too, with the there's the private clouds, where you can have point to point. Again, that's not new. They used to have point to point mainframe right. type, right? But now we're doing it in, in the internet space. You've got point to point that you can secure, and that's kind of private. Then you got semi private. You got hybrid approaches as you pull that data from different sources out there, and you got public clouds. And this stuff is still evolving, and it and it's uh, it, it really comes down to yeah. You, it's the castle and moat mentality. It, it doesn't work. There is no perimeter anymore. Uh, it's, it's more like uh, fire bases in Vietnam. You're carving out spaces and, and, and you're creating some security around it. And then you've got delivery back and forth between different supply chains to keep yourself up and running. I think it depends upon whether you're outsourcing to a provider that is more security conscious than you are or less. In that one of the assumptions that a lot of people when, make when they're doing this outsourcing thing, well, you're always outsourcing. Unless you personally are touching the dials and the knobs on the device and nobody else, you are hiring somebody else to do that. And you, they may work for the same employer that, as you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their interests are aligned and that they will be a conscientious employer, etc. And if you look at a lot of the enterprises that are outsourcing, in many cases they will improve security because they may outsource to a bunch of incompetent adults, but they still outsource to a bunch of, they're still more competent than they are. So, the problem, you know, so, so just saying, you've got to do it all in-house, it's going to come in-house, I don't think that's really relevant. You're always going to be outsourcing. You're always going to be transferring control to somebody else. The real question is, are you going to do it smart, and are you going to do it in a way that you understand the processes in place that are going to protect your security at the other place? Or are you going to do your outsourcing decision simply by choosing the very lowest bid of the people who submitted? You know, well, when you talk about the, the security, right, when you have that increased uh, visibility and global view, right, so you're not only monitoring, you know, from a cloud perspective or a services perspective, one organization, you're now doing it tenfold or twentyfold. You're able to see attacks on a different scale. You're able to protect things on a different scale. I mean, that, that's essentially what a lot, a lot of these newer businesses are, are providing that and those additional benefits from a security perspective specifically. Well, from, from the security perspective, you know, taking all of this into account and you look at it from a security perspective, this is what we're seeing, is the enormous paradigm shift that's taking place here is that up till now, Basically, the, the whole concept of security was security required information. You had to have up-to-date information about the threats, about the vulnerabilities, about whatever it was you're defending against. And up till now, the whole concept was you had to move that information in a timely way to the point you're trying to protect, whether it's a gateway or a client computer or, 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 or uh, the, a DNS server or whatever. But that's, that's, what, that's, that's what we're seeing as the huge shift that's going on. We're moving away from the concept that you've got to move all this information to the point of protection. And the, the new architectures that are coming out in, in the security industry reverse that model and the, the point of protection has to recognize, all it has to do is be able to recognize that this is something I need to check before I do it. And then they, using, using cloud computing, they query they query somewhere and get that, go retrieve that information from outside the network as to whether this, that, or the other thing should be allowed to happen. And so we're, what we're seeing is and it's, it's, it's an enormous thing for us because in, in, the, in, the, in the AV industry in particular, the infrastructure we've built up for, for the last 20 years has been for that old paradigm. And we're going through an, an extremely rapid transformation where we're basically turning our whole infrastructure 180 degrees so that we can get, we can make those queries happen fast enough. And it, it's, but again, it's, it's moving away from that moat mentality. But I mean, 
how can people keep up with it? I mean, there's so many information sources. There's so many things happening. Well, I mean, if, it's impossible to. I mean, well, no, I mean, it's not impossible. I mean, you, you, but just just for instance, our our um, our reputation service that our reputation services that look at the that look at the because one of the things you can do now that you couldn't before is the almost all the threats come from somewhere identifiable. I think it's like 92 percent of all threat vectors come over the internet as opposed to say from a thumb drive or by some other removable media or something like that. Well, that, that allows for enormous complexity on the part of, and gives an, it's enormously enabling for the bad guys. But on the other hand, the one advantage for us is that anything that comes over the internet comes from somewhere identifiable. There's a source. So instead of, you know, we're moving from where you examine, like in the case of, of some malware code, rather than examining the file itself, the executable file itself, you just look at where it's coming from. And if wherever it's coming from is a bad place, don't even let it come. And so there are, are, you have these, these, something like our web reputation service, I think we're dealing with about a billion queries a day for our customers is what we're processing about sources of, sources of, of uh, for downloads. And so, yes, you can, but it requires you to completely change the infrastructure around. I mean, I mean, we live in a time, I mean, 20 years ago, the concept that you could talk to any server on the planet in the same time it takes to access your hard drive was, I mean, that was, that was, uh, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, that wasn't even in our minds, you know, at least, you know, in, in the, but so, so it's not impossible for us to use some of the same mechanisms. So. Well, I actually, that's, that's probably a good place to pause because I know we're running a little over and actually ending a security conference on a little bit of an up note might be an unusual <laughs> thing to do, so I'm going to jump in right there. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time and uh, we'll, we'll be up here for a few minutes if you guys want to uh, come up and talk about some items individually. Thank you. Thanks.